Hello, and welcome, or welcome back to AdvancingMentalHealth.org's video channel. I'm Jeff Baker. In this video segment, we're going to be doing another interview with Gary Brown. For those of you not familiar with Gary, he's an attorney who for over 30 years has dedicated his practice to representing people who have been captured, put into a psychiatric hospital against their will, and want to get out. In this interview, Gary's going to talk about the laws of informed consent as they relate to physicians in general, and in particular, psychiatrists. Gary will talk about the information that psychiatrists are required by law to give their patients before getting their consent to treat them. We found this interview extremely useful, especially in today's world where the laws of informed consent are generally ignored. We hope you like it. Here is Gary Brown. Well, Gary, thanks for joining us today. Appreciate it so much. Always my pleasure. So today, uh, we're going to be talking about informed consent and Gary, I just wanted to start out by asking you to please uh, define what is informed consent and also what are its origins. Oh, sure. You know, it's fascinating because this is really the root of all the healing arts and it was lost, its purpose was lost, and people think it's some kind of a modern in innovation uh, for the benefit of people. But let me go backwards. We're talking about something that's been around since the origins of healing on this planet. Uh, and it roots in spiritual and religious philosophies about how people get well and how they're helped to get well. And we'll find it in, for example, in the times of Hippocrates when he developed his wisdom uh, which led to the promise or oath that we would always try to do good for people and never cause them any harm. And the basis is this. What do we think is wrong with you? That's the diagnosis. What do we think that can be done to help? That's the idea of offering a remedy. What is this remedy about? Are there other remedies that are offered, even though I'm not advising it. I'm now talking as the uh, healer. And uh, even if I'm not advising it, I want to tell you there are other remedies that are potentially available that you may want to consider. You may want to go get another opinion. You may want to search out information. But the point is the patient is in charge of their destiny and entitled to the information so they can be fully informed. That has to happen before they're asked for their consent. And if it doesn't happen that way, the physician or other healer involved is doing wrong. Now, it's more than unethical, it's illegal to not provide sufficient information and obtain informed consent. Overall, in today's world, what's considered to be the purpose? of informed consent. Oh, sure. Because the patient, the person who's not feeling well, the person who's not doing well, is in charge of their own life. And we've lost that somewhere because I noticed that people revere their doctor. And the word doctor is a religious term that refers to wisdom. You know, doctor is found in many, many different areas of life, including medicine and English and philosophy and history and physics. So the idea is, is we're looking for wisdom and it's up to the patient to make the decision. And the healer is simply an advisor, a consultant who hopefully has wisdom acquired, who can convey information in words that the patient can understand so the patient can make an intelligent decision. It seems like a lot of that idea that the doctor is the counselor and the health choices are up to the patient uh, has been lost. Oh, definitely. And so, 
I'm just wondering, could you trace that a little bit? How, how, how do we lose that? Huh. That's a phenomena of the modern era. Let me suggest that education has been dropped in this area so that people don't realize the relationship they're forming with the individual that they so quickly call doctor. And the point is, is that we have to help the people realize their own responsibility for health and their own choices available to them. Okay, now what are the laws currently on the books relative to informed consent? Sure. We think of laws, most people think of laws as printed statutes reflecting legislation that was passed. But actually laws come from yet another direction, in fact more commonly, and that is called the common thinking of mankind, and in uh, the case of America, the common thinking of mankind as it was in England when America was formed. We call that the common law. And the notion of informed consent travels to this time through the common law and through the reinforcement of court decisions much more than legislation. However, I'm quick to add, there is definitely legislation on the point. And I'll give you an example. In California, we adopted around 1967-68 something called the landerman Petrus short Act, which is an act which amongst its many uh, purposes is to separate out from society people who are deemed dangerous or gravely disabled to, due to a mental disorder. Well, within that act, and putting aside any other aspects of it right now, there are specific written rules about providing informed consent to patients, as well as providing written materials in their files. Now, is that followed? My 30 plus years working in the mental area shows me it's not followed. It's not that it's never followed, but it's not followed and certainly not faithfully. And the hundreds of people that I've helped over the 30 plus years uh, confirm for me that they never had the discussions that informed consent would require. So now when we get to laws, we have to think of application as well as statutes. And what we have here is we have some statutes. In California, we have a code of regulations. The code of regulations has a set of rules about what's supposed to be followed, which includes informed consent. We have uh, a set of laws in the Health and Safety Code as well as the Penal Code protecting confined people, that's prisoners, so that they're not made part of experiments without appropriate warning and written permission granted by them. So we do have some statutes and other states have some statutes, but the primary basis of the informed consent law and rules has been handed down by court decisions. We can find it embedded in the California civil jury instructions where they tell us what informed consent is consistent with what I've explained today. And they also provide for a cause of action, I mean a legal claim against any healthcare practitioner who doesn't follow this rule. Now, I, I'd like to talk about an area of medicine in the mental health area. And um, this is uh, an area of psychiatry. And in terms of informed consent, the psychiatric world, uh, when somebody goes to psychiatry for help or they're captured forcibly and turned over to psychiatry, the attitude in the culture of psychiatry is that people have come to them because they're not in their right mind and they are not able to make good decisions on their own behalf because they're not thinking correctly. And it seems that it's an area where informed consent has truly gone out the window. <laughs> so 
Um, talk to us about what people's rights are in those sorts of situations. Absolutely. This is a complex area because it touches upon philosophy, social philosophy, civil rights, and so forth. And I'm going to try to be as brief as possible, but I have to touch on these areas for a moment. We consider people to have innate, inalienable rights. And amongst those rights, we find those rights in both the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, which are not binding law in our country, but they remind us that people universally see the world that way. And we have rights that were adopted in our Constitution to protect against then known wrongs. And we have the Ninth Amendment, which says that if it isn't spelled out here, it's still maintained by the people. So we have to look at history to see what was really going on. But the important idea is people have basic inalienable rights. And one of those rights is to be remarkably different from one another. So we have to decide why differences matter. In our society, wisely, and historically this has been the case, developed something called the Penal Code. And it said, certain actions are so wrong, we're going to stop you from doing them, we'll even possibly punish you. Now everybody knows that murder is wrong, and rape is wrong, okay, and stealing is wrong, and so forth and so on. What has happened over time is we've had always on this planet some group of people who don't act and don't think within the more normal limits of people around them. So they are literally, and the word applies, abnormal. But the question is, what of those people's conduct are we going to protect so that we don't step on the genius and we don't step on the creative forces of life and we don't squelch an innocent fool simply because they're annoying. And this has been a struggle that we haven't undertaken openly and that's very regrettable. Because the assumption is, is that if somebody isn't thinking in a normal fashion, there's something wrong with them. And they are categorized that way. Now there's a group that exists called psychiatry, and there is another group called psychology, and each has its own separate origins actually, and parallels and interactions. And what they hold in common is that they label people based upon their apparent uh, ways of acting, and they attribute that to the uh, assumed ways of thinking. Now, when I say assumed, yes, they talk to people and people tell them stories about what they're thinking. But we know in medicine, when you go to a good physician, they're going to diagnose you based upon objective criteria and not where you complain the problem comes from. But in the areas of the mind, we have a different set of standards being applied. And to simplify it, and I learned this from a wonderful, brilliant psychiatrist named Thomas Saz, all you have to do to obtain a psychiatric diagnosis is annoy somebody. So now the question is, what happens when you annoy somebody and the people on the street, the police, the social worker, thinks you come within a law that allows you to be captured. Or you show up at a hospital and tell them your story, and usually you're upset, and you're not making sense to the person listening. So the point is, what happens when a person arrives and somebody thinks that person comes within the capture laws? The principle of informed consent remains. Nobody is presumed to be too stupid to understand simply because they're upset. 
there is a world of difference between an upset person and the capacity to learn and process information. Now, granted, they may not process it very well while they're upset, so they may need time to calm down. And confronting them face to face and pushing pills in their face without getting their permission is not a way to help them calm down, nor a way to respect their right to make an informed decision about medication or any other form of treatment. But the important point is the psychiatrist who is a physician by license and trade is subject to the informed consent rules and must answer questions like what I'm offering you and what alternatives there are and what risks there are and they don't do it. And they push drugs on people that are ultimately very, very dangerous and harmful. We're now learning, and it's becoming more understood, that antidepressants cause suicidal ideas and probably cause the violence that leans, leads to the unwanted gun violence that we're dealing with. These are controversial issues, uh, and the point is we need to be looking at them and discussing them, but certainly the physician knows of them and should be informing the patient of these risks, their known risks, and of alternative therapies. There are many alternatives to psychoactive medications, and the psychiatrist will not address them. So the point is, the laws of informed consent fully apply to the psychiatrist. They're not obviated, they're not eliminated because the person is upset. You cannot suddenly turn an upset person into a stupid person by definition, and you have to get a court order before you can drug them without their permission. This is an area that truly needs to be opened up so the public is informed. I want the healers informed because I think a lot of people go through their areas of education with good intentions but lack of sufficient information um, on how they're impacting their patients. I want the people involved in the mental areas of practice to appreciate the impacts they're having, not because you have a bad intention, but because of the condition of the people you're greeting and how they feel when they're being greeted in the manner they are. Thank you so much. You're welcome. I appreciate your time and your expertise. Uh, always my pleasure, and I invite more lawyers to contact me so we can help the public understand better and better represent the public in their need for fairness in this area. Very good. Thank you. Thank you.